All right, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter number 6 briefly, and then 1 Kings chapter number 8 afterwards. So Hebrews chapter number 6, we're going to read just the first three verses that we've read now for uh, quite a number of weeks as the starting point for the message this morning, Hebrews chapter number 6. And if you are using the Pew Bible, that's page 1246 in the Pew Bible, if you're using the Pew Bible. Hebrews chapter number 6, and we'll read the first three verses there, and then we're going to look in 1 Kings chapter number 8 after that. But Hebrews chapter number 6, verses 1 through 3. The Bible reads, um, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we, we will we do, and this will we do if God permit. And if you recall over the last couple of months, we've looked at the last month and a half or so, we've looked at each one of those individually. Uh, repentance uh, from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, if you'd be so kind, turn with me up to the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter number 8. 1 Kings chapter number 8, and that's page 397, if you are using the Pew Bible, page 397, 1 Kings chapter number 8, and we are going to read the first nine verses here, actually the first ten verses, the first ten verses, 1 Kings chapter number 8. First Kings chapter number 8 and the first 10 verses, and we begin verse 1, the Bible says, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those that the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord, unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, that the end of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. And we're going to stop there and pray this morning again. <coughs> Lord, such a wonderful, wonderful passage of scripture as we look back at the history that you've given us of the nation of Israel and what they did, your bidding to prepare a place for uh, the ark of the Lord and for the presence of God on this earth at that time. Father, as we look at the temple, as we look at the structure there, I pray you would help us to take the truths of this passage of Scripture and this account and apply them to our lives in a way that can help us today and benefit us today. Father, I don't believe there's any mistake as to why we're here this morning. It's not a it is this planned thing, Lord, but it wasn't just planned by us, it was planned by you as well. This time and this hour are God, thine and thine alone. I pray, Father, you would use it to your honor and glory, that you would work in our hearts and help us to be a little more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because of our meeting here this morning. I pray for your blessing and thank you so much. Thank you so much for who you are and what you do. We ask now in Jesus' name, amen. So for the past uh, seven weeks, we've been looking at scriptures that give us a foundation in Christian life. What it means to lay a good foundation for building on, for, for, for Christian growth. 
Uh, the writer of Hebrews, we read in Hebrews chapter number 6, uh, talks about laying, not laying in the foundation. Now, in, the old, in, in, in that time, during that time of the Hebrew writer, uh, the people that were getting saved had a problem. They would come to the Lord, and they would get saved, and they would get grounded in these fundamental truths, but then they would never go anywhere from that point. They would never grow. They would never move on to maturity. They would never become what it is that I wanted them to be. Sure, they would get the foundational aspects of Christianity down, but then they would not move on any further from them. And that's why we, we looked at the great writer of Hebrews said, you're like you're like little children, so I need to treat you like kids, and you shouldn't be. So i got to give you milk when you should be eating meat. I have to uh, teach you when you should be teaching others, is what he was telling them. He says, you've got to grow up. He said, lay a foundation and then grow up. So that's what you need to do. And uh, that tendency uh, was what the tendency was in that day. Now, in our day and age, it's kind of a little different. We don't have that tendency anymore. We want to grow into maturity without ever laying any foundation. See, we live in a different world nowadays. We live in an instant world, instant everything. You know, instant rice, we have an instant pot, we have an instant pot in the house. You know, I can go online and do instant access to my bank account and then transfer money instantly on my bank account. You know, I can do all kinds of things instantly. And as a Christian, we want instant growth. We just want to be mature Christians instantly, but it takes time. And it takes work. So as for us, we need to go back and lay a foundation oftentimes we never have. And then build what we're supposed to build. The Bible talks, we talk, I mentioned this. The Bible says, a wise man digs down, lays foundation before building the house. A foolish man builds a house on the sand, and it all falls apart. So we talked about the foundation, the six things uh, that are mentioned in the book of Hebrews that give us the foundation of, uh, for Christian living, but then the writer of Hebrews makes this statement, let us go on unto perfection, or in other words, let us go on unto maturity. In the Bible, the word perfect doesn't mean uh, sinless or without error, it means mature. It means fully developed or fully grown. That's what the word uh, perfection means. It means to be developed, complete, mature, and not missing anything. We're supposed to grow on to mature Christian life. I'm not supposed to just lay a foundation and leave it. Nobody does that, do they? Let's say you want to move out here and build, you buy yourself a, a piece of property and, and you clear out the property from the trees that you want and find a perfect place to build your house. And so you, 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 you level that out and you get it all set. And then you have somebody come in, you lay the foundation and say, well, you're done. I'm good. That's, that's the beginning. Foundation is the beginning. The foundation is the beginning. We're supposed to move on in the Christian life to maturity. If I could use a sports a, a illustration or a sports analogy, uh, let me do that this morning. In sports, you learn the fundamentals of playing before you go out to play. At least you should. You should. When I was younger, I told you my favorite sport was basketball. And I remember the first time I went out for basketball tryouts when it was a, it was a closed uh, uh, thing there with, you know, on the military base. And uh, a whole bunch of us went out for basketball tryouts. And he had the kids who'd been playing now for years. I was already about 10 or 11 at that time. And then he had people like me. This was their first time ever touching a basketball, let alone standing on a basketball court. And, and so we would all go out, we'd all try out. And then the coaches would pick all the kids that they wanted. And uh, the, kids, the coaches did. They picked all the kids until their team was full, and there were about seven or eight of us left over that nobody wanted. And so uh, one of the fellows said, well, I'll coach those guys. And, and he, he got us together there. And, and, uh, and I remember there was twin girls, redhead and a blonde. And then there was a bunch, and then about three or four other guys and me. And none of us knew how to play. So the coach had to teach us the fundamentals of the sport. And it teaches how to dribble. How to dribble the ball without accidentally hitting yourself with it and knocking it across the court, you know? And it teaches how to, to, to pass. And it teaches how to pass so that we did so the passes didn't get intercepted and somebody else take it. Yeah, it teaches how to do a layup. I remember when I was on my trials, I couldn't even do a layup. I didn't know how to do a layup. I'd never done that before. They said, do a layup. Like, What's that? <laughs> no idea, you know? And then it teaches how to shoot from the free throw line. Then it teaches how to shoot uh, from different part, different places on, on, on the court. And then it teaches how to walk and to run, how to, how to do a layup without traveling. I was traveling. I don't know. I didn't know what that meant. I had to learn the fundamentals. But the fundamentals aren't where you stop. You learn the fundamentals so that you can go on 
and then learn the strategy on how to play. They can teach you all the strategy they want. They can teach you to stand here, do this. Well, this is full court press. This is half court press. Be here. Run this little uh, circuit here. You block that guy so he can go by. And but if you don't know how to dribble the ball, you're not going to win. If you don't know how to shoot, you're not going to win. If you don't know how to make free throws, your team's not going to do very well. So you got to learn the fundamentals so that you can grow, but you don't stop at the fundamentals. You go on uh, beyond the fundamentals. The purpose of learning the fundamentals is so that you can play effectively to win the game. And the purpose of the foundation of the Christian life is so that I can move on to maturity. That's the purpose. God wants me to grow into a mature, developed Christian. He doesn't want me to remain a child Christian. Now this morning, we're going to look at this passage in 1 Kings chapter number 8. Several times in the Bible, the Bible mentions us as being the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Bible says that we are the temple of God. In 2 Corinthians 6.16, it again says that we are the temple of God. And in many ways, the Christian life mirrors the temple of the Old Testament. When Solomon was building the temple, the Bible says Solomon was seven years in building the temple. From the time the foundation was laid to the time the temple was eventually erected, it took seven years. And in the Christian life, it's very similar. We lay that foundation and then we move on from that to grow in maturity, but it takes time. It takes time for us to grow. But here in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Kings chapter 8, rather, 1 Kings chapter 8, the temple has now been constructed, the temple has now been finished, and Solomon gets all Israel around to dedicate that temple. That's what he does. He begins to dedicate the temple. So all the people come out to him, all, all from the tribes, and, they, and they're there at the temple, and the priests are there, and they're bringing animals, and they're sacrificing animals, and they're dedicating this temple to the Lord, this holy place where they're going to have the sacrifices, where they're going to have the worship, the central point of the religious system of Israel, this temple, they're getting it dedicated to the Lord, and in the whole chapter of 1 Kings chapter 8, we see Solomon uh, before the people doing different things, and we see different things taking place, and there are seven things listed in this chapter that reflect mature Christianity. The seven things that happen at the dedication of this temple are the same type of seven things that in our lives reflect a mature Christian life. Now, we don't, are not going to look at all seven today. Don't get worried. I know it's, 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 our stomachs are telling us it's an hour later than it really is. I know that. But be, hang with me. We're only looking at a couple this morning. But over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at these seven things that are done here in 1 Corinthians 8 that give us a picture of what it is to live a mature Christian life, to go beyond just laying the foundation. Yes, I understand. Repentance from dead works. Yes, I know I'm supposed to turn from, from, from an old life. I understand that. Faith in God. I understand that. Faith in God. I understand the baptisms. I understand laying on of hands. And I understand all the things we've been talking about. So where do we go from here? Let me show you. So in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon begins this dedication process. And seven things take place. Let's look at a couple this morning. Let's look here at 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse number 6. Three verses 6 through uh, 10 here. It says, And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, and the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle. And they were not seen without, and they, 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 they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark, notice this, save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Now let me give you a little let me explain what's going on here. When they built the temple, it was to replicate the tabernacle that God gave to Israel. The tabernacle was divided into three parts. It had an outward part, which was called the court of the congregation. That's where the sacrifices would take place. That's where the animals would be killed. 
And that's where the priests would wash themselves when they were doing their service and before entering into the is this more central part. It's a very big court and, uh, and uh, where all the sacrifices would happen. Then there was a second section to the tabernacle. So you would come and move into a se separate section which had a, a veil in front of it. And inside that part, there were three pieces of furniture. There was a candlestick, like, sort of like a menorah, that they would light. And then there was, uh, there was a, a table, sort of like this table with bread on it. And then there was an altar where they would burn incense. And that was called the holy place, okay, that holy place. It was separated from the congregation, and only the priests were allowed to come into that holy place. So let's picture this, this structure now. So, so, the tab, so let's picture it like this. This out here would be uh, the congregation where all the people would go. But imagine there was a big curtain here, and I would walk in here, and then there was a room in here where there was a candlestick and a table with bread and an altar, and that's all that was in there. Then there was another curtain with an even deeper chamber inside the temple. So you had the congregational place, and you had the holy place, and this was called the holy of holies, or the most holy place. And in there, the, there were two structures. There, there were two, two uh, uh, angelic beings, they were called cherubims, made of pure gold. And they would stand, uh, one here and one here, and their <coughs> wings would touch each other, in the middle, and then their wings would go out to the outside wall, and into that place was one piece of furniture, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. That's it. So you had the outside place where all the people would gather and where the sacrifices would be made. Uh, and then you had the inner place where you had the candle and the, and the bread. And then you had the table of bread and then the, the, the incense altar. And then you had the holy, holy place where only the Ark of the Covenant came. And when they dedicated the temple, the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant and set it into that holy place. Now when they set that in the holy place... The Bible says the cloud came into that holy place and filled it with the presence of God. Could you imagine today if we were here in church and a dark cloud of the presence of God just filled this building and filled it so much that no one could enter in. We all would have to go outside and just wait as the presence of God dwelt here. Wouldn't that be amazing? Now I say the presence of God is here. It's here because we're here. The Bible teaches us that. But what they did in the dedication was the first thing they did is they put the, the, the Ark of the Covenant in its proper place. That was the first part of the dedication ceremony. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? According to verse 9, there was nothing in the Ark except for two tables of stone. What were those two tables of stone? Yeah, Ten Commandments. Those were the two tables of stone that when Moses was up on the mountain, God was sitting there with his finger writing on those tables of stone. God was giving them his word. God was saying, you're not going to do this, you are going to do this, you're not going to do this, you are going to do this, and writing them out with his very finger. And when Moses brought those two tables down, they put it in, and, and after they built that ark, they put it into that ark of the covenant, and that's what it stayed in, and then they put that ark into the center of the tabernacle, which is a picture of the importance of the word of God in our lives. God gives us the word Okay, he gives us the word of God, get read out by the Lord, and God says, this is my word, now here's what I want you to do with it. Put it in the center of your life. Just like the temple. Just like the people, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant and set it in the center of the temple, in the holy place, this should be the focal point of the Christian life, right here. It's the Bible. And the mature Christian, because as a sign of maturity, we grow in our desire to make this important in our lives. That is a sign of mature growth. So I learned all this stuff to build a foundation. Why? So I can start moving on to maturity and making this important in my life. Your maturity in the Christian life is intrinsically, it's linked with uh, your uh, priority in the Word of God. As we grow to maturity, the Word of God becomes more important to us. It becomes our focal point. As we mature as a Christian, we will make time for the Word of God. Have you noticed how everything demands our time? Everything. Everything does. The phone does. Oh, I love the phone. I love it. No, I don't really. I grow. I hate it. I hate the phone. I really did. My uh, growing up, I hated the phone. My mom used to make me call people. I hated it. I'd argue with them. Oh, I don't like all the people. Then she made me call places with automated, uh, automated voices just to get me to call people. 
So you got to use, use the phone. Call this number. I don't want to call the number. And we, we instead of a number, you would call it on the base, and it would tell you uh, what the weather was, what movies were playing at the movie house, and, and what, what, well, what, what sporting events would take place. So she would make me call that number on a daily basis just so I used to call it on the phone because I hated the phone. And then I move out here, and you know what I get? More spam phone calls than I've ever gotten in my entire life. <laughs> I think the same place called me three times the other day. And then you call it back, and it's not even a real number. That's why they don't call them back. I don't even answer the phone. I set, I set the answer machine to the lowest number of rings before it picks up. You notice that. You, you call the church, it only rings two or three times it picks up. You know, on purpose, because 90% of the calls I get are all, mm, you have won a trip. No, I haven't. Don't worry. <laughs> but everything's so demanding, isn't it? The telephone rings. What's it doing? It's demanding our attention. The, t the TV programming comes out and the schedule's all set. What's it doing? Demanding our attention. Everything does. It pulls at us and tries to get us uh, to, to, to focus in on that. But you know what never demands our attention? I, I close up my Bible and lay it on my desk. I have never had my Bible when I walk in the room say, Hey, look over here! Never happened. Never if I set the Bible on a nightstand in my room, it does not move there until I move it from there. It does not demand my attention. It's not going to hunt me down. It's not going to pull me out of bed in the morning tell me to read it. My telephone will pull me out of bed in the morning, but the Bible never will. My job will pull me out of bed in the morning, but the Bible never will. If I'm to grow to maturity, I must make this central in my life. Just like the Israelites did. They took that Ark of the Covenant and they moved it into the center of the temple, in the very uh, middle, the focal point. This word needs to be the focal point of my life. The Bible, the Word of God. The mature Christian understands that and makes time to read it. The mature Christian understands that and makes time to study it. The mature Christian understands that and puts it into practice. That is maturity in the Christian life, is putting the Word of God in its proper place. That isn't the only part that we see here. As they dedicated the temple, the Bible says they put the, the in verse 9, they put the Ark of the Covenant in the, in the holy place, put the two tablets of stone of the Bible, or the Word of God, right into the focal point. And then let's look what it says here in verses 10 and 11. It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. After the Bible, or after the Word of God was put in its proper place, the Bible says the next thing that happened is God's glory or God's presence entered the holy place. So get the picture here? Priests are out in this part, sacrificing. And they're down towards there, and there's an altar there, and they're, cut, they're sacrificing animals, they're, they're killing them, and, and they're sacrificing them. The Bible says they didn't take the sacrifices and burn them on the altar. It must have smelled like a barbecue pit or something in there. Just all these animals being burned there. And, and, and then, then the priests are coming, and all the people are there, and, and, they're, and they're rejoicing in the fact that God has given them this beautiful temple that's been built, and they're rejoicing over what God's done. And these priests, these four priests come in, they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Now, no one was allowed to touch it. So they had these, these staves, these long sticks they would put into these rings on the corners, and they'd carry it on their backs, and they'd bring it in, and everybody can see them coming in, and they enter into this holy place here, and it would be beyond the curtain where no one can see them, and the Bible says that they enter in here, and they pull the staves, those long sticks, out of that, and they stick them out in such a way that people can see that they pulled the staves out of the side, and they're sticking out uh, like that so people can see part of them. And all of a sudden, the priests walk out, and all of a sudden, a giant cloud just comes and fills that. And the people can see that the presence of God is there. And the priests get to the point they can't even do the work of the Lord because the place is so, so filled with God's presence. A mature Christian understands, first of all, that the Word of God has a, a, a central point in his life. But a mature Christian understands, second of all, the presence of God in his life as well. Not only does he understand that the Word of God needs to be a focal point, he understands that the presence of God is what's important in his life. The priests were working hard, sacrificing animals, 
burning them for the Lord. The priests were working hard, getting everything together, bringing the altar, bringing the, bringing the, the tablets in and placing them in the place. But when God's presence entered, all the work stopped. The people were amazed at the presence of the Lord. The Bible tells us in verse 11, the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. The mature Christian understands the place of the word of God. The mature Christian understands the importance of the presence of amazing thing when we reach a point in our life where we just stop being so busy and just stand before the presence of the Lord for a while. The priests were working hard. The priests were doing their job. The priests were busy. The priests were sacrificing. The priests were burning incense. The priests were working. And then the presence of God came and they stopped. I ask you this morning, is there a time in your life where you get to that point where the presence of God supersedes everything else in your life? We're such busy people, aren't we? Always on the run. Always on the go. Always got something to do. Oh my, if I was to write a list of all the things I need to get done or want to get done, that list would be so big I probably wouldn't be able to complete it in two or three lifetimes. We're always on the run, always busy, always running, always doing, always going, always got something I got to do. My schedule, look at my schedule, what's coming up, what's going on. We have events going on at the church, we have things going on with family. The holidays are coming, shopping needs to take place. We got to get the decorations out, we got to prepare. Uh, hopefully, uh, I told my wife, my wife, she's like, I'm going to start getting ready for Christmas. I said, yeah, yeah. I always tell her, got to wait, got to wait. Got to wait for Thanksgiving to pass first. We're always so busy. Running here and there, doing this, doing that, working hard, doing all that we can possibly do. There needs to come a point where we just stop and appreciate the presence of God in our lives. There needs to come a point maturity starts to happen and we begin to realize how important it is to set some time aside just to enjoy being with God. I love little babies. So cute, aren't they? And adorable. I love little babies, and I can remember our children growing up, and they have such tiny little toes and fingers. How do little little babies grow up to be such big people? I don't know. They're so small and cute, adorable. It's amazing to watch little children develop, isn't it? And they start out real small, and they have it seems like totally oblivious to everything going on around them. Here you have a child that's only a few days or a few weeks old and trying to get their attention. Hey, 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 they're sitting there. Just taking it all in. It's almost like overstimulus, light and sound, and everybody's sitting there tickling. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like the little, little babies when they're sitting in their seat and they don't have any little socks on their feet and they like tickle their toes. They see them kicking, but they have no idea what's going on. They're just like, they're totally oblivious. This is amazing, though, as the weeks pass and you see them start to focus in on things. <laughs> when you hold the bunny up and move it, they actually watch it with their eyes. You hand them a, you hand, you, you feed them a bottle when they're when they're little, and they just lay there, and you got to prop it up with a, with, with something maybe if they're laying there in, in their seat. And then, and but as they grow and develop, you start bringing it over, and then they reach up and grab it for the first time. And you begin to realize my child is beginning to become aware of their surroundings. They're becoming aware of who I am and aware of what this is and aware of what that is. And they're beginning to understand things a little bit more. And that's what Christianity is. And he gets saved. It's just so amazing and wonderful to, 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 to have our load of sin lifted and, and have that taken off of our lives. But it's an amazing thing that as we grow in the Lord, we start to become aware of God's presence. He's here. He always is. It's amazing when we become aware of and we begin to see things in a different light, we begin to see that, oh, this happened. <coughs> God must have been in charge of that. We were driving to, to town yesterday to pick Sarah up from work and got behind a vehicle that was just driving so extremely slowly. I mean, the speed limit was 45 and they were doing 30. Oh. And you know, there's so many opportunities to pass between our house and Mount Torquemont. <laughs> And what's the worst part is every time you come to a passing zone, that's when another car is coming this way, and you can't pass anyway if you'd like to. 
I just got first. I, I I looked over at Steve and I said, I am this. It was yesterday. It was two days ago. I said, I was driving so slow. This is driving me crazy. And finally, we passed the Sportsman's Club down here, and it opens up, and I I just I just floored it, went around him, and he hung up the cell phone, just talking away. And then I said, maybe God did that. <coughs> Maybe God slow you down. See, I like I, I used to be like, oh, I can make it to Montoursville in 16 minutes. Watch me, I can do it. Now, now it's like I can make it there in 25. <laughs> takes about 22 if you drive the speed limit. I won't tell you how fast I drive when I take 16. <laughs> you know, maybe God's the one doing that. Maybe God's behind it. And when we begin to become aware, God's very real in our lives. And his presence is very real in our lives. When we begin to realize that, that's when we're beginning to mature as a Christian. You know that thing that went wrong the other day in your life? That probably wasn't wrong. That was probably God doing something right. You just didn't know it. By the time you broke down on the side of the road and you thought, what am I doing here, Lord? That could have been God protecting you. You don't know that. The time you got the phone call you didn't want to get, you're like, oh, now i got to rush out and do something I didn't want to have to do. That could have been God moving. God's very real. He's very, he's very around us. What we need is an awareness. And in all of our busyness, and all of our work, and all of our doing, and all of our schedules, sometimes we forget to stop and just enjoy the presence of the kingdom of God. When Solomon began to dedicate the temple, he went through seven steps. Those are the first two. They brought the word of God and set it in the central part of the temple, and that put the word of God at the proper place in the Christian's life, right in the center. This is my focus. This is what's important. And then the presence of God filled that temple to the point they had to stop working and they couldn't do what they wanted to do because God's presence was so great in their lives. It's a wonderful thing we have to stop and realize God's presence in our lives. Let's bow our heads for prayer this morning.